But this evening, as we begin, we're speaking from Daniel chapter 6. And so far to this point, we've been talking a great deal about God. God is, I will say that as we go throughout the book of Daniel. For one, God is the Most High God, and He has shown Himself to be that time and time again, as we've seen different men who thought that they could exalt themselves above God. Kings and emperors throughout history have oftentimes sought to exalt themselves, maybe by oppressing the people of God, as we've seen with Babylon, as we've seen with others, maybe by even going against God Himself. We'll see some of that even tonight in some senses. I'll mention more as we get through our text. But it makes me think back, not just as we've studied throughout the book of Daniel and seen this, but we've studied times in, in the past where we've looked to God's people, uh, many different mighty men who have sought to oppress them. In the eyes of the world, they would look at someone like the king of Babylon or the kings of the Medes and Persians, and they would think that's the greatest person on the face of the earth. That's the most powerful empire in the world in the eyes of man. And we look back and we studied before speaking about God's people as they were under bondage of the Egyptians back in the book of Exodus. And you recall how so much the, this Pharaoh sought to oppress the people of God, putting them through rigorous labor, just, just constantly making a harsh burden on them. And this man would even go against God by having all the male children killed, thrown into the Nile. We might call him a a uh, historic abortionist as he sought to murder all the male children. We've seen not only through those times, but even as we've gone and studied throughout the times of Christ, the Roman Empire was at hand. The Roman Empire was in charge, I should say. And the Kingdom of God was at hand. And we've seen just how much maybe those in that time, Jewish people sought to kill those who even belonged to the Lord and even the Lord Himself, Jesus Christ. Uh, we remember Herod as he sought to kill Jesus, uh, being just a little child, a little baby. And yet so often these people have sought to destroy the plan of God. In fact, you even see later on that the Jews used the Romans as a tool, that they might destroy the Son of God, they might put Him to death thinking that they've got this. The devil thought he had this. Until the point we find well, Jesus Christ was killed, but with a purpose that He might redeem man from sin, He might save the world from the oppression of death and sin. And ultimately, when He was raised from, dead, from the dead, 40 days later, He would ascend into heaven where He reigns at the right hand of the throne of God. To the reason I mention all of this as we begin is because constantly we see throughout the book of Daniel, our God is the Most High God. Our God is the one who puts kings in their positions. He removes their sovereignty. And we see that throughout the entire Bible. We see that throughout history. And we're going to see that continually as we study throughout. But we might mention a couple of things. The times are changing. As we've been studying throughout the book of Daniel, we've come to find that very events happen again. Last week we were studying about the king, Belshazzar, who just like Nebuchadnezzar, he exalts himself against God. And you remember what happened to him. Just as Nebuchadnezzar, we came to find he was made to be like a beast of the field. Well, the very night that Belshazzar exalted himself against God in this drunken feast, worshiping the gods by drinking out of the, the vessels from the household of our God. He's praising these gods of gold and silver, and that very night, we come to find that he is slain. The sovereignty is completely removed. And the Medes and the Persians have now taken the, the empire of Babylon. So what do you need to do? If you have an empire, you've taken over. What do you need to do in order to prosper, in order to succeed, in order to have it go according to plan? You set people up in charge. As Brother Gregory read just a moment ago, he set up, Darius has set up 120 satraps. That's just another word for assistance. These men that are going to be in charge over the kingdom. He's also set up three different men, three different commissioners. We know Daniel is going to be one of them. They are even higher in position. 
it's something that is necessary to, to run a great empire. You, you think about this in modern terms, maybe not with an empire, but if you were running a business, a, a restaurant business is what, so, something that comes to my mind. You have someone who's in charge over everything. You would appoint different managers. You would have maybe a chef, a, a sous chef. You would have uh, different people that are serving. You would have a host. You have to have all these different people to help it function properly, to go according to plan and to succeed. But what's so different here, we come to find Daniel is going to basically distinguish himself from the rest. He's going to be set apart in one sense. And the king himself wants to put him above everything. Now I want us to think about that just for a moment. If you were looking at all these different men who had a great authoritative position. And then they see this other individual. You know, maybe you see this even in a workplace. You want to have a promotion. You want something to go great for you. But yet, that other guy over there, he's going to get this promotion. You know what often happens when people see that? They become envious, they become jealous, and they're going to do something about it. You see it here, you see it throughout time, you see it even in religion, unfortunately. But what's so unique to me, we're going to mention more about that in just a moment, what's so unique to me, these men are going to try to find a way to find grounds for accusation against Daniel. So the very first thing they do, they, they're going to find, okay, maybe we can get something against him in regards to government. And we know as Christians, as children of God, not, not only now in the New Testament, but even in the Old Testament, people who follow God understand that we are to be obedient to government. I'll explain how far that is in just a little while. But we are to be obedient to government. You see in Paul's letters in the New Testament, and even by Paul's actions uh, over in the book of Acts, just how much he was respectful to government when he was before kings, when he was before governors, different people in charge. He always was respectful. But we also, we come to find, well, Daniel. Daniel is a person who also is, he's found basically, in one sense, blameless when it comes to how he is according to government. He's one who is obedient. He's one who uh, is living as he should. But it reminds me of something. How many times throughout the Bible do you see other people strive to get the people of God concerning government? Jews in the New Testament, the very people who used to be the people of God, the, the physical Jews, often did this towards Jesus. They did this towards his apostles. They would accuse them of going against the Caesar, saying that there's another king other than Caesar. If you wanted to, in the times of the Roman Empire, to get someone punished, tell the Roman officials that there's these individuals who are going towards another king. You can get them punished just like that. But I want to mention something as we're talking about this. We come to find, well, yes, they're going to try to find grounds against Daniel. They're going to see a way they can make him suffer. They can punish him if they can find out how to do this. We're going to see how in just a moment. That they're going to have to go against him and the law of his God. That's the only way they're going to find grounds to punish Daniel. And that brings me to a point. If you have your Bibles, if you would turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. Because there's a need to mention something. If we as Christians are going to suffer. Again, 1 Peter chapter 3. Starting in verse 13. He says, Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God should will it so that you should suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. You could imagine, when we're talking about this with Daniel, if they found grounds to accuse him in regards to government, if he was disobedient in that way for doing what is wrong, 
But Daniel, we understand the only way they're going to get him is if they catch him doing something as he's living for the God of heaven. It's so relevant to our day and time. How many times do you see today where people are trying to get Christians in trouble with our God? Maybe as the agenda has been pushed today, the homosexual agenda that's being pushed throughout our nation. We understand the problem with that, but many are told that you have to go, you have to preach this wedding for that, you have to bake a cake for that or you will be punished. Now this is not something we understand that is against those individuals. We cannot support sin, just as we cannot support another marriage that is one that would be causing one to commit adultery. We cannot support any marriage that is unlawful in the sight of our God, that God did not ordain. But one of the things, when we're talking about these individuals back in the book of Daniel, I think everyone here would agree, these men are jealous. They're envious. They're ready to do something. And the decree that they're going to try to get made by the king is that maybe you'll put them to death. That they are to make, that no one can make a petition to anyone but you. No God, no man. Now, if you're a person who craves power, if you're in an authoritative position, this is going to sound pretty good to you at first. You're going to think, I'm above everyone. They're going to think that they're above God. Whatever gods this man worship, I don't know. But he would have been exalting himself even above the Most High God by making this decree. That's something to remember as we go throughout this lesson. And the things that jealousy often causes people to do, I want us to think about that. Jealousy, envy. You see it all the time throughout the Bible. You remember back even in 1 Samuel, and I know chapter 18 is one of the passages. I'm not going to be reading from there this evening. You might mark it uh, just to go through and read later on. But you remember even Saul. He, he's hearing all these people that are chanting out. You know, he's slain his thousands, but David is ten thousands. You remember what that made him want to do? You remember how he wanted to treat David? He wanted to kill him. In fact, he threw a spear at him later on. You see jealousy so much throughout the Bible, how men, even in the times of Jesus Christ, they wanted to trap him, they even wanted to kill him. We often interchange jealousy and envy. One of the reasons that Jesus was put up to Pilate, he was delivered to Pilate, was because of envy. Imagine what it was like in the times of Jesus, where you see this individual who is coming out who's claiming to be the Messiah that the Scriptures have foretold of, that people knew for hundreds if not thousands of years, and he has a great following. All these people are looking to him. They're saying he's performing these great miracles. He's healing the sick. He's raising the dead. In fact, when you read in the book of John in chapter 6, you find where he has fed 5,000. And you know what the people there wanted to do? They wanted to take Jesus by force and make him their king. What kind of a following when you see thousands and thousands of people looking to Jesus Christ? And for religious leaders in that time, like the scribes and Pharisees, they would become jealous, they would become envious, and they would seek to act on it any time they could. They would try to find the grounds to get something on him, to trap him, to put him to death ultimately. And we see this even in our day and time. How many times... You might think back. I don't see this as a problem here. But you might think back in the past, maybe in, in worship itself, maybe as we meet together with the saints, there's even problems in the religious world of jealousy causing problems among churches. It can lead brethren, it can lead individuals to, to resort to slander, to resort to gossip, to resort to many different things that will cause us to stray against God and it will cause problems, even divisions, among a congregation. Jealousy is everywhere. It's something we have to be careful of as the children of God. But this decree that is set out, no one can make a petition for 30 days to any man, to any God. This foolish decree is made that basically has exalted this man above everything. Now I want us to, to consider a couple of things. If you hear about this, 
If you're a child of God, what do you do? You've just been told, and Daniel knew this. We know Daniel knew this, as Brother Gregory read just a moment ago in the text. That this decree has been made. Well, in our day and time, people think, I don't know, we, we live in a politically correct society. I can't, I can't go worship my God. I, I can't, you know, I've I got to go make that cake because I'll get sued if I don't, if I don't make it for that wedding. And people often, they will cave in to the pressure of the world, the pressure that ultimately comes from Satan because they fear the consequences of man. Now we don't have to go to the words of Jesus. We know it. For us as Christians, we have no need to fear the one who can destroy the body. We rather, we must fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. That's the God we serve. That's the God we revere. Not man. And this brings me to a point as we're talking about this. Daniel knew this. Daniel was going to go ahead and do the exact same thing he had been doing before. Pray to his God. That's the point. That's how far our loyalty to government goes. When the government asks us to do something that is against God, when they ask us not to pray to God, when they ask us not to speak about God, that is the only time I will ever tell you to disobey government. When it interferes with us, when it causes us to disobey our God. That is the only time. And you see, throughout the scriptures, more, many examples of individuals, Christians even, who were told, you need to disobey God. People who told Christians, you don't need to speak about Jesus Christ. In fact, you remember, as we've studied, we've talked about in some of the sermons and even just mentioned in classes in the past, when you read back in Acts chapter 3 and 4 and 5, these three chapters are remarkable. Because you come to find the first thing, Peter and John, they meet somebody. They meet this man who is 40-something years old. Let me ask you a question. If you were in your 40s and you had been lame from your mother's womb, how easy would it be for you to walk? Even today, if you had the help of our technology, of surgeries, of all these different tools and instruments they use to try to help people walk, it would probably take you months and months and months just to get partially where you could walk, if you could even do it. And Peter and John meet this man who was lame from his mother's womb, over 40 years old. Well, he's, he's out there. He's been carried every day near the gate of the temple. He's begging for alms. And Peter and John, they don't have gold. They don't have silver. But they possess something far greater. That through the power of Jesus Christ, they were able to make this man raise up and walk for the first time. And it wasn't this struggle to walk. It wasn't that he was going to walk three weeks later correctly. They helped lift him up. His, his legs are strengthened. And then he leaps up all the way. And as he's running through, he's leaping and walking through the temple. This man has been healed through the power of Jesus Christ. And Peter and John, they use this as an opportunity to proclaim of the only one whom you can be saved by. In Acts 4 and verse 12, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. There is no way with the way of Jesus Christ. And they knew this. Now we understand there was confrontation to these men. These people are going to come about, and it's often because of jealousy, but these people are going to come about, you have no right to speak about them. That's basically what they told them. What's remarkable to me is Peter and John, they understood, we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Could you imagine if Peter and John and the rest of the apostles had listened to the authoritative people and they did not proclaim Jesus Christ, no one would have heard of the gospel. No one else would have been saved. And it didn't in there. In fact, you remember, if you move on into Acts chapter 5, you see how some of the apostles are in prison. God is the one who makes the release happen. And these men, the apostles, make another opportunity. 
that they're going to preach, they're going to teach again because they know how important this is. They know the reason and they have a desire to save everyone. You know what these men were, what they said? Ultimately, Peter, he often seems to be the bold spokesman of the group. But when they were confronted again, you know what Peter told them? He said that we must obey God rather than men. I want us to remember that. I know we've emphasized that to a good deal to this point, but any time the world today tells you, any time government, any time any officials, anyone, tells you that you are not allowed to proclaim Jesus Christ, that you are not allowed to pray to Jesus Christ, that you are not allowed to live for the Lord, disobey the government. Because Jesus is the only one that can save us. You know, there are cultures, there are places over in other countries today where Christians are told they cannot even meet like we are this evening. China is one that often comes to mind. It's in some cities illegal for them to meet as a congregation. So they have to go, they meet in houses, they meet in underground churches. Again, make it a point we do what's right in the sight of God regardless of what man says. But as we continue on in our lesson, back in the book of Daniel, you remember these men, they have been seeking ultimately to get Daniel in any way they can. They have to do this by their God, by his God, excuse me. And so we've seen Daniel himself. He knows this. He knows the decree. But he goes and he prays to God as he has continued to do. Now you know what happened next. I think most of us are very familiar with this text. This is, again, one of them that we studied throughout our childhood. We studied growing up many, many times. In verse 11, it says, Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. These men, when this happened, you know they think they've gotten what they've wanted. They've caught him. They've caught Daniel in the act. Now they can go and they can tell the king about this Daniel. But they don't do it just in that order. You know what they do? They don't go to the king and just say, Daniel was doing this. The first thing they do, they go and they remind the king, you remember this decree that you made? If anyone is going to make a petition to anyone else, any man, any god, They're to be thrown in the den of lions. You remember that? And I want you to remember this one statement. You're going to see this multiple times in some form or fashion. At the end of verse 12, when the king replied, he said, The statement is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Read through and in your own studies. And mark down how many times in one way or another that is mentioned. There was a very important, there was a great seriousness when it came to the laws of the Medes and the Persians. When it was made, it didn't matter who you were. You can't change it. And they've gotten him to recognize this. So now they use this opportunity to say, well, your buddy Daniel has been doing this. I say that He's his buddy because you will see later on just how much affection he does have for Daniel. It's clear that he was very fond of him. I don't think he really thought about this one bit when he made this decree, who this would affect. And to notice what they say. Verse 13, Then they answered and spoke before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you. Now notice there, stopping at the point, he pays no attention to you. Basically, they remind him of this decree. They tell the king, he's not paying attention to you. They're basically calling him out as a traitor. Because he, he's not going to do what you say. He doesn't have any regard for you. Or to the injunction which you sign, but keeps making his petition three times a day. Now let me ask you a question. I want us to think about this in the eyes of Darius the king. I want us to consider this in our day and time right here, right now. How would you feel if you came to realize the foolish thing that you did, or that I did, anyone, 
Call someone that you were very fond of to lose their life. That's what they think is going to happen. That ultimately, that's what we would think would happen. But what if you did something that was going to cause a great friend of yours to lose your life? How would you feel? You know, you would be trying just like Darius. I'm going to find a way. I'm going to rescue him. Or I'm going to stop this. If you knew something was about to happen to your friend and you thought you could stop it, you would do it. Darius, at this point, he wants to try to stop it. He wants to try to rescue him. But you know what these men do one more time? They're going to remind him again of this decree, according to the law of the Medes and Persians. In verse 15, Then these men came to agreement to the king, and said to the king, Recognize, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians, that no injunction or statute which the king establishes may be changed. You know, I often wondered when reading this, if they were saying this to Nebuchadnezzar, if they had such boldness to speak this to Nebuchadnezzar, what he would have done to these individuals. But they remind King Darius, this can't be changed, not even by the king. It can't. And just think about that for a moment, what I mentioned just a moment ago. If you were the reason, if Darius is the reason that Daniel is going to be ultimately put to death and it's what they think is going to happen. What if you were, maybe you had participated in drinking and then you got behind the wheel of the car and you had a friend with you in the, in the, drive, in the passenger seat. Well, we understand for one, how wrong that would be. But the very next thing that happens, you're driving down the road, and then you crash. You don't get hurt, but your friend is basically now on life support because of the, the choice that you have made. He's in the hospital. You're not able to go, and you're not able to see him just yet because they've told you not to. Do you think that you would sleep that night? Do you think that you would be going and watching TV and maybe just having a good time? We would be just like Darius. That very night, Darius, he can't sleep. He has no entertainment. He's fasting. We would be the exact same way. We would not want to do anything. We would constantly, every thought we have would be, is he going to make it? And the very second that we knew we could go and we could hear, we could find out, we could see how is he doing, we would be running down there to see him as quickly as we can. And in fact, we remember, again, if you have studied through and you've read through this in the past, you'll see with Darius just how much he wants to find out how is Daniel doing. And I want us to notice, we're going to read through the last part of this chapter. And I want us to notice for one how Darius, who again, just like many others we've read about, is a man who would have been very polytheistic, he would have worshipped other gods. I want us to notice how he speaks about the God that Daniel serves and the things he says even about Daniel himself concerning God. In Daniel chapter 6 and verse 18, Then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no entertainment was brought before him, and his sleep fled from him. Then the king arose at dawn at the break of day, and went in haste to the lion's den. When he had come near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you constantly serve, notice that there, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me, and as much as I was found innocent before him, and also toward you. O king, I have committed no crime. Then the king was very pleased and gave orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury, whatever was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. Notice. The king then gave orders, and they brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel, 
and they cast them, their children and their wives, into the lion's den, and they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then Darius the king wrote to all the people's nations and men of every language who were living in all the land, may your peace abound. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed, and his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So you notice the result. It's not any surprise to us. We, again, we've studied this in, our, in the past time and time again. But it's remarkable to me, for one, just how much Darius knew Daniel served the, his God. In verse 20, the king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you constantly serve. You think about the life we live as Christians. I want to mention this. The life that we live as Christians. Other people notice. It doesn't matter who we are. Other people notice. If you are living a bad example or you are living a good example, people are going to pay attention when they know you are a Christian. I know I've told you this before. But to me, it makes a very valid point. A person I used to work with who said that because of one example was all it took. But that individual thought that every single person who was a Christian was a bad person, was a hypocrite, was someone who was just a horrible person. That's all it takes, one example, to set someone away from God. In the same light we understand, it can take just one example of someone who is living as a light of the world, as Jesus told us, to let our light shine so that men would see our good works and that they would glorify our God in heaven. Same exact thing. Someone can see that one example and turn to the living God. When people see in our lives that we are a beacon of light that is looking to God and looking to Christ, how much more are people going to want that when they see, for one, there's something different about you? They, it's clear they saw something different about Daniel. Darius did. But when people see there's something different about you, there's something you have that makes you happy all the time. And that makes me think of something. We as Christians, we should be the happiest people on the face of the earth. And it worries me because many times you see Christians going about looking the exact opposite like there's no hope in the world. We have all the hope in the world if we have Jesus Christ. If we have Jesus Christ, our home is in heaven with God. And people should see it. They should see that it can help someone to transform the most ungodly people can turn to God. We've seen it when we talked about Paul. We've seen it when we talked about other individuals throughout the Bible. I've seen it personally from individuals who now preach the gospel, who were once drug abusers, alcoholics, uh, addicted to pornography, different things. These men have changed their lives completely because of God and His Word. The gospel can transform anyone who will follow it. And what's so remarkable here, we're going to point out a couple of parallels to what we see in this text, and the lesson will be yours. You know, Daniel, he tells this king, my God sent an angel who shut the mouths of lions. And they delivered. He was delivered by the angel and by ultimately God, yes. The very same thing we think about today. We are also, just like Daniel was then, God's children. And we may not face a physical lion. None of us, I don't think, have ever been across that. But every single one of us here has the same enemy who seeks us the exact same way a lion would seek its prey, the exact same way a lion took down those individuals that were thrown in after Daniel was taken out. Our adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 
It is Satan's goal to take and destroy absolutely every person he can to kill them so that they will suffer with him. But if we remember, for one, that we, just like Daniel, you see how Daniel in this passage, at the end of verse 23, he trusted in his God. We must trust in our God. If we are trusting in our God, we are faithful to our God, we rely on His strength, God's going to deliver us from Satan just like He did Daniel from the lions. Satan, the one who seeks us like a lion. And something else that I think of when I look at this text. What's written here? What did King Darius proclaim was so great about God For one, his kingdom. This everlasting, this kingdom that will never be destroyed. Even Darius recognized this about God. And his dominion will be forever at the end of verse 26. Do we think about this even here and now? This still is something that we reflect on right now. I want you to think back just for a moment. For one, as we've studied throughout the scriptures, we know Jesus Christ himself came to this world. We're going to end on this point. He came to this world, and in order to conquer the one who sought us like a lion, the one who sought to destroy us like a lion, and enslave us into sin and death, Jesus Christ came and allowed them to nail Him to the cross. Satan thought he had the victory. Until the point, three days later, God raised him from the dead. It was impossible for him to be held in his power. You want to speak about how God is the Most High God, how man constantly thinks they can overpower God or they can do anything and just to prevail? God always prevails and He always will. And despite all these great kingdoms we've talked about, despite Babylon the Great, in the book of Daniel, despite the Medes and the Persians, despite Greece that would come, despite the Roman Empire, any of them, what you continue to find, Jesus Christ, after being raised from the dead, 40 days later, ascended to heaven, where He reigns at the right hand of the throne of God. And the kingdom that He reigns over, each of you here this evening, who is a Christian, You are part of the glorious kingdom that will never be destroyed. The greatest kingdom that there ever is, there ever was, there ever will be. So this evening as we close, we ask the question, are you part of His kingdom? Do you recognize that there is another kingdom? If we're not careful, if we turn away from God, we will end up becoming servants of Satan. We will end up joining the kingdom that Satan himself would offer Maybe you found yourselves as Christians going back to the ways of the world, serving the devil, being deceived, and maybe following some of the things we've studied throughout the book of Daniel that these kings and other individuals have done against God and against His people. And that you realize you need to make it right this evening. We encourage you, if you have any need, to respond to the gospel in any way. We would encourage you to do so while we stand and while we sing.